Good morning and welcome. You're listening to the first full episode of Dharma Review. Let's just be straightforward here. For those of us who consider ourselves spiritually oriented individuals, many of us have felt that we have been thrust into some sort of alternative reality, some sort of parallel universe, one which we thought the possibility of which we had left in the past, especially in this 21st century age, an age of rising awareness and wakefulness, or so it seems, or did seem. I want to start by pointing you to a recent episode of Gangaji Radio, episode 49. It's titled, Blindsided, Spirituality and the Election of a President. It was aired on November 14th, 2016. Gangaji was interviewed while she was in Australia, where she was holding an event at the time. Her comments may or may not surprise you. Here's what she had to say, and I'm quoting Gangaji now. We are certainly poles apart in our opinions, but the unifying force is this mystery of love. And I don't want to even use that word. Maybe love is too spiritual a whitewash, and I don't want to do that at all. And I think sometimes people expect spiritual teachers to act as Hillary and President Obama acted beautifully to calm the nation and prepare for the transfer of power. But that doesn't mean you aren't experiencing what you are experiencing. And if that takes you to the street in protest or petitions in protest or to whatever future action may be, then I salute that. I am not speaking of ends. I'm speaking of where it all begins. And we can recognize that in everyone. I mean, I do respect the protesters that were on the street. I think we have to respect whatever our particular process is for finally coming to clarity, a clarity that is solid and can meet anything. The moderator of the show then says, you know, this feels like a car accident. When you didn't feel it, you didn't see it coming, and then you spend these days with moments going, actually, this feels like it couldn't have happened. And then there's the direct blow, even to the body. When I emailed you and asked you how you felt about doing this special, I joked with you and said that someone had texted me and said they were relying on chocolate and Xanax. And I was like, well, that's not such a bad idea. But it does, I mean, in all seriousness, it does feel like a huge assault to the psyche, to the heart, to the body. And I've had people telling me that they had their grown children calling them in the middle of the night in tears and sobbing. And then Gangaji responds, Well, it's really beautiful, too, that people care so much that it's not just, oh, business as usual, that we were and are involved in our political process 
And I don't separate that from our spiritual life. That's just the way I'm made as a form. I'm always interested in the political outcome. So, I really think it's beautiful and painful. When the heart breaks, it's painful. But it can also break more open and include more and be more intelligent. Because somehow, we should have had some clue this was going to happen. Maybe we were complacent or, or even arrogant. So, in that sense, we've been profoundly humbled by not knowing the country we live in. Yeah, it is like a car accident. It's a shock. But shocks are not necessarily bad. They can be bad. It can be a shock that is really leading to worse. I don't ever want to sugarcoat this, Gangaji said, because we do have history as the model for this, and this is really not a good sign in terms of the toxin in the system. But also, shocks can serve to alert the whole system to get healthier, to wake up. What will happen in this case? I don't know. It's too soon to know, and it's a serious case. So, you know, the worst could happen. It could be a period of American fascism. I mean, it is a vote for that in many ways. And it could be a planetary disaster. It is a vote for that in many ways. So, I want to encourage everyone to stay alert, to stay awake, and to be tender with yourself, and to also be in nature, and to also recognize you can receive love at this time. You can receive the peace that is inherent to your being without betraying your intelligence of fighting for the planet, of fighting for justice, of fighting for inclusion of all people of all kinds. So that's our challenge. It's what it feels to me, and also the challenge to recognize that many of our brothers and sisters don't agree with us at all, are diametrically opposed to us. And that's the reality. And where do we go from here? That's the discovery. I would encourage you all to go and listen to that full entire episode. It includes some powerful encouragement. Go hear it at the source in Gangaji's own voice. It's worth the effort. So, why are we afraid to see life as it is? Are we? This was reported in the Catholic Herald. Pope Francis was answering questions from a group of combined Catholic and Lutheran youth that had arrived from Germany. The Pope had this to say. This is quoting Pope Francis now. The sickness, or you can say the sin, 
that Jesus condemns most is hypocrisy, which is precisely what is happening when someone claims to be a Christian but does not live according to the teaching of Christ. Pope Francis said he does not like, and I quote him now, the contradiction of those who want to defend Christianity in the West and, on the other hand, are against refugees and other religions. You cannot be a Christian without living like a Christian. He said this and then went on to say, you cannot be a Christian without practicing the Beatitudes. You cannot be a Christian without doing what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 25. This is a reference to Christ's injunction to help the needy by such works as of mercy, as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and welcoming the stranger. He then said, It's hypocrisy to call yourself a Christian and chase away a refugee or someone seeking help, someone who is hungry or thirsty. Toss out someone who is in need of my help. He said, If I say I am a Christian, but do these things? I'm a hypocrite. Wow. Okay. So what are other spiritual leaders saying? And what have we heard from them on this subject? Are our teachers speaking about it at all? If your teacher has commented, won't you please contact us and tell us what has been said? We'd love to hear about it, and I'd love to share it with everyone. Now, in a recent satsang, Krishnadas was speaking at, uh, to people at the Hanuman Temple in New Mexico via Skype. He didn't precisely mention uh, any of the political events, but this is what he had to say in answering some questions that were put to him. The deal is you work with what you got as you perceive it. You don't wait for somebody to push a button and turn the lights on because that ain't going to happen. The lights are on. We're just wearing sunglasses so don't wait for something to happen from the outside world. Everything we need to work with is right within us right now. It's with us right now. It's in our lives right now. There's no reason to wait for anything. Guru, God, and self are not different, really. That's the bottom line. The fact that we think they are different shows what we don't know. When you look at Hanumanji, what he really is, is a mirror. You're not looking at something outside of yourself. You're looking at a mirror of your higher nature. So when we worship the murti of Hanumanji in the temple, what we're really worshiping is the form inside of us. We're actually looking at a mirror of our true nature, and we happen to be monkeys. So <laughs> there's no guarantees. Whatever karmas you're going to have to run through, you're going to have to run through. The deal is that the love that's within us, that's 
who we really are. That's who the guru really is. Don't wait for the scene to change outside of us. Do what has to be done. Do your practices. That will calm us down and help us overcome our knee-jerk reactions to negative stuff and our clinging to positive stuff. And look deeper and find a deeper place within us. So that was Krishna Das not too long ago. And in reference to the power of peaceful protest, I turn now to Brother Pap Dung, a Zen master, Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery. He said, We need to learn that even in our own personal life, we act out this place of anger and we see that it doesn't help. And this expands to groups and then to nations. Thich Nhat Hanh himself in his new book, At Home in the World, writes, Mindfulness must be engaged. Once we see that something needs to be done, we must take action. Seeing and action go together. Otherwise, what is the point in seeing? Nonviolence is not a set of techniques that you can learn with your intellect. He goes on to say, nonviolent action arises from the compassion, lucidity, and understanding you have within. Sounds like a good book. Now also at Zen Master Hans Monastery is a woman by the name of Sister Peace. And this is what she had to say in a recent interview. There's still a lot of things within ourselves that we need to look at, that we need to erase and heal, so that when we hear this rhetoric coming from outside, we can know that it's not true, and we can hold on to a sense of balance and peace. In some groups, there's a level of angst and anticipation and anger and passion to want to move towards and to do something. Those civil rights advocates, she's referring to the civil rights movements of the past, those civil rights advocates, they trained for that. They were taught how to be quiet, how to be still, and how not to resist, and no fighting back no matter what happens. She went on to say, if we can be strong in ourselves, then we could offer a resistance that is nonviolent. But that means that we ourselves are at a place where we can have that recognition and we can offer that to another. And that is a great, great source of love. And having the other feel that they are being recognized, listened to, and embraced. To be fearless actually means to be peaceful. We have to come out and we have to show what we think in a nonviolent way, she said. Then others will be ready to move in that way. And we can begin to march toward that progress if we do it collectively 
And I think everyone in America does want to do that. And I sincerely hope she's right. You can find that video out on YouTube. There's a series of interviews that were done at the monastery recently. Now, Ram Dass, back in 1995, spoke of collective denial when he said, and I quote, If you think of the German collective consciousness that dealt with, through much denial, what was being done to the Jews and others, is that different from our collective denial that allowed us to idealize and place on our altars people like Donald Trump when we knew that the permanent underclass was being created? Because we could see it around us. We were being denying. We were denying what we were seeing. We had Dynasty, he's referring to the television shows, and Dallas. And then we had an increasing number of people who are the ocean that spreads out into the world over that Mexican border and elsewhere of those who have not. And how much denial, how much closing of your compassionate heart must it take to continue to play the game of King of the Mountain. What's in it for me? And each of us gets the most we can for ourselves. Trickling down, of course, is the assumption that once we have enough for ourselves, we will then create ways to share it with everybody out of our beneficence or out of our obligation, perhaps. That's another level of consciousness. <laughs> wow. He said those things back in 1995. And now let's look at what he just recently said. In a podcast... Uh, the Here and Now podcast in the Be Here Now Network uh, broadcasting, episode 105, Keeping Our Quietness and Love in 2017 is the title. This is Ram Dass, Here and Now podcast, episode 105. Well... There's two things. There's being and there's doing. The doing is social action. We all have to keep our being. We've got to keep our quietness inside. We've got to keep our love. We've got to keep our compassion We've got to keep our wisdom during this time. And on the action side, we all know what we can do to alleviate the affect from Donald. And I think that I've learned that social action and spiritual quietness and listening and the witness the whole thing, this is the thing we can do. These two things coming in. I'm not telling everybody to not follow their social actions, but I want everybody to go into that social action with this quietness and love and wisdom. That was Ram Dass, recently, here and now, podcast episode 105, Keeping Our Quietness and Love in 2017. 
<clears throat> now I want to quote from uh, another podcast called Mind Rolling, episode 176, entitled Love is Beyond Time. This is from Ragu's podcast, Ragu Marcus. This can be found also on the Be Here Now Network. This is from an episode with Sharon Salzberg and Danny Goldberg as they revisited a retreat which they all had participated in with Ramdas and Jack Cornfield, whose main topic was finding the beloved, touching the compassionate heart. This was sometime just after the election. Raghu says, Of course there was a lot on people's minds. Then he asked his guests, Where were they? And what were they doing that fateful night? Sharon, who lives and teaches at the Insight Meditation Society, was involved in facilitating the end of one of the six-week intensive retreats that night of the election. She commented that in this case, just posting the results on a flip-up sheet for those who just had to know on the bulletin board, that's what they normally did during elections, but that just wasn't enough. It took a lot of processing, she said. It wasn't enough just to announce it. And then she went on to say that at their sister retreat, Spirit Rock, she heard that people actually fainted and others just started sobbing. Raghu then says, One of the core things that we have to really help each other with is how do we handle our reactions, our anger, our fear on one hand, and try and straighten out that inner part of ourselves which is so polarized in this situation and at the same time not just sit on our hands. Danny, who's been an activist for a long time, offered up that he thinks it's very important to reach out to the groups of people being singled out right now, and members in particular, so that they do not feel too isolated and alone. And then he went on to say that it would be helpful to really, really look at the history of this country. And he emphasized being really realistic about what this country is. It's had many, many periods of darkness, he said. It was created with great darkness. It was created with genocide of Native Americans and almost a century of slavery and then another century of so-called reconstruction with Jim Crow and just terrible racism. He said, when we grew up in the 60s, we had a military draft, we had a war where more than 50,000 Americans were killed, we had J. Edgar Hoover as head of the FBI. Really, the birth of second stage feminism and the gay rights movement as we know it today only came late in the 60s and early 70s. He said, my parents talked a lot about the blacklisting period after World War II. You know, I'm reading a book now about Lincoln, and in the 1830s, people were jailed for writing articles opposed to slavery because it was interfering with commerce. So these dark forces that are so scary have been with us for a long time. And there are many examples of people who shone their light in those periods, and I think that it's worth seeing it in that perspective. He then went on to say that we must remember who we really are and that we can be of most help if we can stay centered and connected to the light within us. 
We have to figure out a way to talk to people we don't normally talk to and who don't read any of the things we read and then not freak out every time there's a new appointment to this administration that seems to violate the moral and ethical and rational opinions that we all have. It's obviously a divided country. So then Ragu piped in and said, this polarization is the biggest toughie to see them as a real person. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, everyone wants happiness. It's easy to say we need to see the light, but talk about how we really get at the core of this knee-jerk reactivity. And then he says, to what I feel is just so much ignorance that I just can't seem to cut through in my own self and, and have the spaciousness to even have a conversation. Now, this is where Sharon's answer comes in, and I want you to listen to this very, very carefully. Because the whole purpose of this podcast is to help us all find these kinds of helpful conversations and find the resources that we need to survive these times intact and still be growing in the process. There is so much information and disinformation available now in this information age we live in. And many of us are so busy just trying to keep a roof over our heads and our families together and food on the table and gas in the tank. And in all of that, stay somewhat healthy. It helps. It really does. When we can find real answers, not just canned responses or quoted scriptures or oversimplified statements that we just need to love. Real teachers, real gurus, real dispellers of darkness, and real yogis speak truth, even when it's difficult and unpopular to do so. And mostly, they don't tickle our ears with what we want to hear. They tell us what we need to hear. And it's our souls that respond, not our egos. They don't scapegoat. Rather, they show us by their example just what an enlightened being looks like. And their actions bear witness. I have plenty of examples to share with you through the ages and to illustrate this. And even with things that are happening right around us today by these masters. And yes, there are masters here with us even today. And some may be closer than you think. And many even speak English as their native tongue. As I think you'll find out if you stay with me on this unfolding journey. Okay, let's get back to what Susan said here. I'll quote it as carefully as I can. Susan is speaking now. Well, I think... There are many, many levels to that. I had a whole discussion with somebody the other day somewhere because I think ignorance is a thing. Sometimes people are taking this to the degree of saying, like, all views are equal, and we have to be able to accommodate all views. And this is my view, and this is their view. And I said, 
I don't think that's true. Some views are really biased, and they are ignorant, and they are hurtful, and some actions are really wrong. There is no way I'm ever going to say killing girl babies is correct because it's a custom or it's the way some people see things, or racial bias is correct. It's wrong. But confronting someone as a bad person or an evil person, or to quote your guru, Neem Karoli Baba, she was speaking to Raghu there, throwing them out of your heart is a very different thing. One of the difficulties I find in myself and certainly in talking to people is that the idea of cultivating compassion for someone does not mean you give up the fight. And we think it's one or the other, that either I'm going to have all this hostility and outrage and probably die young and fight and fight, or I'm going to be sort of peaceful and mellow and let things be and have love for everyone in my heart. And it's not like that. I come back to the original teaching of the Buddha, they say, about loving kindness, which was the antidote to fear. Nobody thinks fear is a skillful thing that it's going to help us see options, that it's going to help us carry out action or reach out to people that it's uncomfortable to be with or remember those that could easily be forgotten. So fear doesn't help any of that process. Why not then take a chance on loving kindness and compassion and see what that cultivation does. So where does this leave us? Since Sharon brought up the original teaching of the Buddha, let me share some of what motivated, motivated me. I'm sorry. What motivated me so strongly to start this podcast journey just now. I have wrestled with myself the last nine years with the concept of withdrawal and seclusion versus action in the world. Of particular note to me was an experience I had when I spent six months in Tucson, Arizona, where I met some very serious, serious young anarchists and street kids. It was at a time when I needed some help, and I was short on funds, and I was trying to keep a dream alive of building a musical, artistic, and spiritual ashram in the city. It was an experiment of sorts, a beautiful one, and a very special time of deep meditation, spontaneous music making, and an intuitive effort of living in the present moment while attempting community building. Well, it didn't quite take root, but one very important thing that has haunted me was a discussion I had with a couple of street kids whom I gave some work and shelter to during the build-out of this space. They were a couple, one of whom was convinced that anarchy was the only way to bring change. He talked about refusing to participate in the system in any way that included going to college or holding any kind of a steady job or any having any permanent home. During the winter, he roamed with a group of fellow anarchists, crashing in one abandoned warehouse after another, living communally as squatters until they would be found out and forced to leave. But he had a propensity also to do as much vandalism as possible along the way. He seemed to relish smashing things up. 
when this couple found out what my age was and they figured that I was around during the Vietnam era and after surmising that I was a conscientious objector at that time and had been against the war, they wholeheartedly said, and I quote, then why aren't you leading us? Why aren't you guys telling us how to do it? how to change things. You should be teaching us how it's done. Your generation stopped the war in Vietnam, so where are you now? I tried convincing them that just destroying everything was not a solution, that violence only begets more violence. And then I tried just accepting them for where they were coming from at this time. They had every right to be disillusioned and even angry. And I just tried to be an example. But that young man's words struck me hard, and it stuck with me. And it became a part of my daily prayers and my meditations. I prayed that somehow he and I both would find an answer to his heartfelt plea for guidance. His companion seemed less married to the violent path which he had chosen, and so my focus was to encourage her not to waste too many years on something that would end poorly. I shared some of my personal story with her, and when I found out she loved to read, I encouraged her to invest in herself and think about taking advantage of returning to college. Find something you love to do, I told her. That's a big part of the key. When you are doing that, amazing things happen, I told her. I do not know what became of that young man, but I learned years later, after stumbling across the young woman on the Internet, that she had returned home, had gone back to school, and she recently graduated. Unconditional love. This is what I'm talking about. Unconditional love without judgment and encouragement have effects that we may not immediately see and may not even know about. That and sincere, heartfelt advice that speaks from experience, not theory, but real-world experience. Something that also became clear over the next several years is that One thing Americans had forgotten about was something called eldering. Many cultures had respect for their elders. Many indigenous cultures still do. Standing Rock is a very good example of that. Wisdom is generally learned through regular spiritual practice and just living. But wisdom can also be passed down, and in many cultures it still is. But when you force retirement and relinquish your elders to living alone in old folks' homes, you denude the natural order of eldering, mentoring, and passing of wisdom from one generation to the next. This millennial generation tends to get this. If they hear elders speaking truth to power, they are inclined to get beyond their mistrust of the older generation that seems to always be a big part of the problem. How else do you explain the trust that 20-somethings placed in Bernie Sanders? And on the opposite spectrum, the ones who placed it in Donald Trump and Steve Bennett. This may also explain the proclivity of the move towards an Eastern philosophy that still believes in elders 
and apprentices. Hence, the guru-disciple relationship in Buddhism, shamanism, and the yogic traditions. Now let me address a piece of what Susan was referring to. The original teachings and examples of the Buddha. Many have the idea that Buddha just sat around teaching loving kindness and meditating all the time. This couldn't be further from the truth. He was actively involved with the rulers and leaders of his culture, as well as involved in resolving conflict, even in his own ranks, in the enclave of disciples, monks, and nuns, which he had set in motion. Things did not always bode well. This may help illuminate how enlightened beings act in the world and how we ourselves should be the change. So now let me read from Old Path, White Clouds. This presents the Buddha's life drawn directly from 24 Pali, Sanskrit, and Chinese sources but retold to us by Thich Nhat Hanh. This traces the Buddha's life over the course of 80 years. Let's try and be receptive now. Take a moment to relax. Breathe deeply and slowly in and out for two full cycles. In And now, let everything just go. And let this sacred text speak to you. You know, it is said that the Torah, the five books of Moses, is written in both white fire and black fire, which is a way of saying you must read between the lines as well as what is written. You read what is in black ink, but also read with the spirit with which it was written. I found that all truly sacred texts provide us with the ability to feel as if we are there in the moment, observing the story in real time, in the now, with the spirit of the original storyteller, and also that the text itself is alive and pregnant with messages and meaning for us in our present moment. So let me take just a moment. This is going to be chapter 72, the title of which is Quiet Resistance. I'll take a short break while I find the chapter. Quiet Resistance. It was the day of the Buddha's weekly Dharma talk at Bamboo Forest. A large crowd was assembled to hear him, including King Bimbisara and Prince Ajitsatsu. Venerable Ananda noticed that the number of bhikkhus attending from other centers was even greater than the, the, the two previous Dharma talks. Venerable Devadatta was there, 
sitting between Venerable Sariputta and Mahakasapa. Once again, as soon as the Buddha was finished speaking, Venerable Devadatta stood up and bowed to the Buddha. He said, Lord, you teach the bhikkhus to live a simple life free of desires and to use only what is truly needed. I would like to propose five new rules, which would make our commitment to simple living greater. First, bhikkhus should dwell in the forests and never be allowed to sleep in villages or towns. Second, bhikkhus should beg only and never accept invitations to eat in the homes of lay disciples. Third, bhikkhus should sew their robes from discarded scraps and rags and never receive robes as offerings from lay disciples. Fourth, bhikkhus should sleep only beneath the trees and not in the huts or buildings. Fifth, bhikkhus should eat only vegetarian food. Lord, if bhikkhus followed these five rules, they would succeed in living a simple life of few desires. The Buddha answered, Devadatta, the Tathagata cannot accept your rules as mandatory. Any bhikkhu who wishes to dwell only in the forest has permission to do that. But it is fine for others to live in huts, monasteries, villages, and cities. Any bhikkhu who wishes to only beg for his food may refuse invitations to eat in the homes of lay disciples. But others should feel free to accept such invitations as they provide occasions to help share the teaching. Any bhikkhu who wishes to sew his own robes from scraps and rags is free to do so. But it is fine for others to accept robes from lay disciples. As long as bhikkhus do not possess more than three robes, any bhikkhu who wishes to sleep only beneath the trees is welcome to do so. But it is all right for others to sleep in huts and buildings. Any bhikkhu who wishes to eat only vegetarian food may do so, but others may accept food offerings containing meat when they are sure the animal was not killed expressly for them. Devadatta, under the present order, bhikkhus have many opportunities to make contact with the laity. They are able to share the teaching with those who are just becoming acquainted with the way of awakening. Venerable Devadatta asks, Then you do not accept these five rules? The Buddha answered, No, Devadatta. The Tathagata does not accept them. Devadatta bowed and sat back down. His mouth was turned up in a self-satisfied smile. That night, as the Buddha rested in his hut at Bamboo Forest, he said to Ananda, The Tathagata understands Devadatta's intentions. I believe there will soon be a serious split in our community. Not long after that, Venerable Ananda met Venerable Devadatta at Rajagaha. They stopped to talk along the side of the road. Devadatta informed Ananda that he was setting up his own Sangha and would hold his own precepts and recitations, confessions, ceremonies, retreat sessions, and pavarana days for his followers, separate from the Buddha's Sangha. Deeply saddened, Venerable Ananda informed the Buddha of Devadatta's decision and at the next confession ceremony that took place at Bamboo Forest, Ananda noticed that several hundred bhikkhus who normally attended were absent. He knew they were attending the ceremony at Devadatta Center instead. When the ceremony was over, several bhikkhus went to the Buddha's hut to speak with him. They said, Lord, 
Bhikkhus who have sided with Devadatta are approaching many of us, exhorting us to join Venerable Devadatta's Sangha. They claim his rules are more upright than yours. They hold up your refusal to accept Venerable Devadatta's five rules as proof. They claim that monastic life at Bamboo Forest is too soft, not much different from life as a layperson. They say you only talk about living simply but won't institute the five rules that would assure that the bhikkhus live such a life. They say you are hypocritical, Lord. We were not swayed by their arguments. Our faith rests with your wisdom. But many young bhikkhus who lack experience in the practice, especially those originally ordained by Devadatta, are drawn to the more austere practice of the five rules. They are leaving the Sangha to follow Venerable Devadatta. We felt we should inform you. The Buddha answered, Please do not give this matter too much thought. The most important thing is your own practice of the noble and pure life of a monk. Several days later, Jivaka visited the Buddha on Vulture Peak to inform him that Devadatta now commanded a following of more than 500 bhikkhus. They were all dwelling at Devadatta's Gaya Sisa headquarters. Jivaka also informed the Buddha of secret political stirrings in the capital in which Devadatta was playing a key role. Jivaka suggested that the Buddha make a clear statement that Devadatta was no longer considered a member of the Buddha's Sangha. News of Venerable Devadatta's independent Sangha spread quickly. The bhikkhus were asked about it everywhere they went. Venerable Sariputta instructed them to answer all questions by simply saying, Those who sow bad seeds reap bad fruits. Causing the community to break is the most serious violation of the teaching. One day, while speaking to several bhikkhus, the Buddha mentioned that Jivaka had counseled him to make a formal announcement that Venerable Devadatta was no longer considered a member of the Buddha's Sangha. Lord, we often publicly praised Venerable Devadatta's ability and virtue in the past. How will it look if we now denounce him? The Buddha asked Sariputta. In the past, when you publicly praised Devadatta, were you speaking the truth? Yes, Lord, I was speaking the truth when I praised Venerable Devadatta's ability and virtue. Will you be speaking the truth now if you denounce Brother Devadatta's actions? Yes, Lord, then there is no problem. The important thing is to speak the truth. At a gathering of lay persons some days later, The bhikkhus announced to the people that the Venerable Devadatta had been expelled from the Buddha's Sangha and that henceforth the Sangha could not assume responsibility for Venerable Devadatta's actions. Venerables Sariputta and Moggallana remained curiously silent throughout these events. They did not even answer the laity's questions. Venerable Ananda noticed their reticence and said to them, Brothers, You have not offered any views on Venerable Devadatta's actions. Perhaps you have some plan of your own? They smiled, and Venerable Moggallana said, That is correct, Brother Ananda. We will serve the Buddha and the Sangha in our own way. Many of the laity gossiped about the schism and blamed it on jealousy and petty feelings. Others understood that there must be deeper, unrevealed reasons for the Buddha to denounce Venerable Devadatta. Their faith in the Buddha and the Sangha did not waver. 
One stormy morning, the people in the capital were shocked to learn that King Bimbisara was abdicating the throne in favor of his son, Prince Ajatasattu. The coronation ceremony for the new king was scheduled to take place ten days later on the day of the full moon. The Buddha was concerned that he did not learn of these plans directly from King Bimbisara. The king had always consulted with the Buddha in the past before making major decisions. His concern that something was amiss was confirmed when Jivaka paid him a visit some days later. The Buddha and Jivaka did walking meditation together along a mountain path. They took slow, quiet steps while observing their breath. After a time, the Buddha invited Jivaka to sit with him on a large rock. Jivaka informed the Buddha that Prince Ajatasattu had placed King Bimbisara under house arrest. The king was confined to his chambers. No one but Queen Videhi was allowed to see him. The king's two most trusted advisors had also been placed under arrest because the prince feared they would try to prevent his coronation from taking place. Their families were falsely informed and they needed to remain at the palace for several days in order to assist with important political matters. Politics is nothing new. It's as older, older than the Buddha, believe me. So here's what happens next. Jivaka told the Buddha that the only reason he knew about these events was because he had been called to tend to an illness of the queen's. She told him how a month earlier the imperial guards had caught the prince about to enter the king's chambers late one night. Finding his behavior suspicious, they searched him and discovered a sword concealed under his robes. They led him into the king's chambers and told the king of their discovery. The king looked at his son and asked, Ajatasattu, why were you carrying a sword into the royal chamber? It was my intention to kill you, father. But why would you want to kill me? I want to be king. Why must you kill your own father to be king? If you but asked me, I would have abdicated in your favor at once. I did not think you would do that. I have obviously made a grave error, and I beg that you forgive me. The king asked his son, Who put you up to this? Prince Ajatasattu did not answer at first, but after his father's persistent questioning, he confessed that the idea had been venerable Devadatta's. Although it was the middle of the night, the king summoned his two most trusted advisors to ask for their counsel. One advisor said that trying to assassinate the king was a crime punishable by death, and therefore the prince and venerable Devadatta should both be beheaded. He even demanded the deaths of all the bhikkhus. The king disagreed. I cannot kill Ajatasattu. He is my own son. And for the bhikkhus, they have already made it clear that they cannot be held responsible for the actions of Venerable Devadatta. The Buddha had true foresight in this matter. Suspecting Venerable Devadatta capable of harmful acts, he disavowed Venerable Devadatta's relation to his Sangha. But I do not wish to kill Venerable Devadatta either. He is the Buddha's own cousin and has been a respected bhikkhu for many years in the past. The second advisor exclaimed, your compassion has no equal, your majesty. You are a worthy student of the Lord Buddha. But how do you propose to deal with this matter? The king said, 
Tomorrow, I will let it be known to the people that I am abdicating the throne in favor of my son, Prince Ajatasattu. His coronation can take place in ten days. But what of his crime of attempted assassination? I forgive both my son and Venerable Devadatta. Hopefully, they will learn something from my forgiveness. The two advisors bowed low to their king, as did Prince Ajatasattu. The king ordered the guards to keep the entire incident secret. The next day, after hearing the king's announcement, Venerable Devadatta hurriedly made his way to the capital. He requested an audience with the prince. Later, the prince told the queen that Venerable Devadatta had come to assist him in planning the coronation ceremony. But all the queen knew was that two days after her son's meeting with the bhikkhu, her husband and his two closest advisors were placed under house arrest. Jivaka ended by saying, Lord Buddha, I only pray that the prince will release the king and advisors after his coronation has taken place. The next day, a royal messenger arrived with an invitation to the Buddha and his bhikkhus to attend the coronation ceremony. Soldiers were already busy decorating the city gates and streets with flags and lanterns. The Buddha learned that Venerable Devadatta planned to attend the ceremony accompanied by 600 of his own bhikkhus. The Buddha summoned Venerable Sariputta and said, Sariputta, I will not attend the coronation ceremony. It is my wish that none of our bhikkhus attend either. We cannot lend any sign of support to this cruel and unjust affair. The absence of the Buddha and all his bhikkhus was blatantly noticeable on the day of the coronation, causing questions to rise in people's minds. Before long, they learned the truth that King Bimbisara and his advisors had been placed under house arrest. There grew among the people a quiet, but steadfast resistance to the new regime. Although Venerable Devadatta called himself a leader, the people began to notice differences between how his bhikkhus handled themselves and how the bhikkhus of the Buddha did. The people began to refuse to give any food offerings to Devadatta's followers. Their refusal to support Devadatta was simultaneously a condemnation of the new king. King Ashtasatu was infuriated when he was told of the people's quiet refusal to lend him support. Devadatta was simultaneously a condemnation of the new king. King Ashtasatu was infuriated but he did not dare move against the Buddha or his Sangha, for he was wise enough to know that if he did so, a mighty protest would well up among the people and from the neighboring kingdoms where the Buddha was held in great esteem. He knew that King Pasanadi of Kosala might even send soldiers if he heard that the Buddha had been arrested or harmed in any way. The king summoned Venerable Devadatta for further counsel. And we'll stop there. That's plenty to digest. Maybe we'll continue the end of the story next time. And so now I leave you to listen again to some of the things that were in this podcast or simply to meditate and Let it soak in. Blessings to all. Namaste. I'll see you next time.